Welcome to episode 60 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast, joined by my co-host Mary, a woman who inexplicably doesn't know the difference between Jenny Wade and Jenny Dell. I am just a guy named Weeks. What's going on, Mary? <laughs> Great to <intro> as always. <laughs> I mean, you don't. It, that's sad, but it's okay. That's okay. Fucker. Jesus. <laughs> okay, well, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. How are you? What's going on with you? What's, what's the word? How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm all set oh. to record about Perryville tonight. How are you doing? We are. I'm doing okay. So we're doing what are we doing tonight? Perryville? Is that what we're doing? We're doing the actual battle. Last week we did the lead up. And oh, that's right. We did. I did. So, so what are we doing today? We're doing Perryville today. Yeah, that that's gonna be a good one. We'll talk about that. That's yep. gonna be a good battle. I think it was a good setup last week to set up this mm -hmm. battle because I think, and I think this was your idea. I'm gonna give you credit for was doing wow. this in one episode. I don't, don't get excited. You heard it here first, folks. He you gave know, me credit. Weeks gave me credit. As a wise man, the Millennium Falcon once said, don't get cocky. Okay. <laughs> kid. But kid. Okay. But um, I think it's important to do this in two episodes because it really would slight the battle or slight the approach, the road to Perryville. So, you know, good idea by you. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, I just thought, you know, like on our Facebook live that we did not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before we talked a lot about the importance of the Kentucky campaign and just how it doesn't get discussed a lot and how it's an important thing in the Civil War, you know, and like, you know, you have things like Antietam and Second Manassas and South Mountain going on around the uh -huh. same time as this, as you have, you know, Battle of Richmond, which is kind of the, the, the first big battle, the Kentucky campaign, but then you have Munfordville and all these little things that are on the road to Perryville. And it, it plays into how, you know, uh -huh. Bragg and Buell end up at this. It is a little crossroads town like Gettysburg. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, the Kentucky campaign, like Kentucky, like as we discussed on the last, you know, we talked about this in our episode about Richmond. We talked about it um, in our episode last week. Like Lincoln had to have Kentucky. You know, if he doesn't what if have I Kentucky. What if I told you? I don't think the Union wins the war if Kentucky goes Confederate. Oh, I would completely agree. What if I told I, you? I think it would really fuck know. things up. Like, I, I, I don't think, you know, something like an Antietam would matter. And, you know, you have like the elections in 1862 as well. That could have totally been a complete game changer uh -huh. with that. And it might have even factored into the elections of 1864. But then you have the other border states that might just be like, well, F this, like, we're going to fucking vacate the dance floor too and go with the Confederacy. If Kentucky's going, then so are we. Well, it's needless to say, Kentucky is of utmost importance. The Battle of Perryville is the crescendo of the Kentucky campaign. Mm -hmm. So it's equally important. But more important, Mary, is what are you drinking? What am I drinking tonight? I am drinking Off the Grid by Lake of Bays, which is a hazy pale ale. And I chose that because Buell is pretty much off the grid for most of this battle. And I'm drinking it out of my George Henry Thomas mug because Thomas is in this briefly okay i'm drinking a beer called jackie from treehouse which is local here drinking it out of our ride with the winter mug which we got so yes from that's the awesome john larroe of larroe design designs just a reminder just a reminder that um he's got some pretty awesome merch on there including a charles tilden t-shirt and an oliver mm -hmm. otis howard t-shirt and you can get those designs on mugs as well so He's been that a great supporter cool. of the podcast. So thank you to John LaRoe again. Shout out to him. That is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So let's talk about Perryville. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, when we talked before about this, we'll kind of, you know, go back a little bit and kind of tread back to how we ended last week's episode. So October 7th, which is the day before the Battle of Perryville, William Hardeen is left wing of the Confederate Army is in Perryville. And they, yep. they, you know, they set up those picket lines um and they're defending those three roads coming in uh, into the town they're going to defend a position on peter's hill which is one of several undulations in the area we're going to talk throughout this Rolling entire Hills. battle there anywho um you know buell is arriving that day he's going to fall off his horse who knows what the hell happens but he's going to be hurt he's going to spend most of the seventh and the eighth on a chair with his leg up because he hurt his reading leg. Reading a book, apparently. Is he's what he reading does. a book at the, at the Dorsey house. Who knows what he was reading? Probably something Danielle Steele. <laughs> but what happened is, you know, the, the whole thing is it's communication errors from the get-go. So mm -hmm. we mentioned before, sometimes battles happen on their own schedules. Now, Kentucky, you know, um, 
it wasn't supposed to happen in Paris Village. Very to your point, just very much like Gettysburg. It just kind of happened that way. Yeah. Well, um, Hardy, Harvey, uh, Hard, Hardy, Hardy kind kind of stumbles upon it, right? And he recognizes the importance of it. You know, not only does it have six roads leading out of it, which gives them a line to retreat on, but it Perryville also offers them a spot to protect their supply train, which is uh-huh. behind them, and that way the Confederates can't get to it. Um, the other thing I want to mention too is Hardy's setup, which I mentioned in the last episode. You have yeah. uh, the you have um, it's oh I don't have it in my notes, <laughs> but it's you- it's Bushrod. Um, no, it's uh, Sterling A M Wood Bushrod Johnson. And yeah, and he's got he's got Joseph Wheeler, the, the war child, the yeah. cavalry guy. Yeah. Uh, and he's under the um under Simon Baldwin Buckner. We'll talk about mm-hmm. Simon later on here. Yeah. But the most important thing about Perryville is the water. It's the mm-hmm. H2O. And they're in the middle of an extremely heavy drought. It's very hot. There's not a lot of water everywhere. And that's what's going to draw these armies together. This is literally a battle that, that begins over water. Okay. Mm-hmm. So as we talk about this, we talked before about how this sets up. Um, General Gilbert, who's commanding the who's commanding the, the corps in the uh, in the Union Army, he's going to order that 10th Indiana under William Colbaugh, uh, Kyes, and Speed Fry. We talked about last mm-hmm. time, and they're going to hit set up a pick a line of Peters Hill, and they're going to bump into that Seventh Arkansas, which is right up there with them. This is the night of the seventh, late night of the seventh. Uh, Colonel Daniel McCook, Mary, there's two McCooks at this one. Um, Phil Sheridan's division and Gilbert's corps. He's going to be ordered to occupy that hill and protect the creek and the water they found because they found water. It's like finding gold. Yeah. But by now, Bragg, he knows what's up and he's going to try to bring his Confederate army together. Um, you're going to end up a situation where um, the Rebs are going to find themselves the night before this, uh, the night for the battle on the 7th, sitting in Perryville, knowing the next day was going to bring on quite a battle. So the 8th yeah. of October, 1862, early in the morning, the Battle of Perryville is going to begin. So mm-hmm. Phil Sheridan's second corps, um, his second division of the third corps under Charles Champion Gilbert, one of the best names in the American Civil War, <laughs> by the way, Mary. He's going to order Dan McCook's 36th Brigade to move and occupy that Peters Hill and control that water in the area that's called Doctor's Creek. Literally to, told him, literally hold your water. That's literally what he told him, <laughs> right? Well, I don't know if he literally told him that, but that was the gist of it. Now, his troops, primarily the 52nd Ohio, 85th, 86th, 125th, Illinois. The thing about them, Mary, is they're all green and they're all experienced. And like we said before, as Kermit has told us, it's not easy being green. No, and especially, especially not, the, especially not in this battle when you're you're going up against mm-hmm. some hard fighting troops. The other thing that happens too is like Buell has learned that the Confederates are halted at Perryville, and he had been like, okay, we'll attack on the eighth, but then he decides no with the first and the second corps being delayed, he decides that he's going to wait till the ninth. But as you said, he does send those men in to look at the water. So he knows that's happening. Um, so there's really like both sides really don't know what the other side is doing. But meanwhile, you have Hardy who's got, he's just limited to three of Buckner's brigade. So he's got Sterling AM Wood, Bushrod Johnson, who's on the right of Wood, and then General St. John R. Liddell, who's going to have these Arkansas brigades that are going to be some of the first ones that are engaged in this early morning skirmishing. Yeah. So they're going to engage at 7th Arkansas under, under Colonel David Gillespie, all right? And he's in Liddell's brigade that you had just mentioned. And they actually, although be green and experienced, they actually do pretty well. They actually take that hill. They actually get it. Now, I mentioned before about Buell. He's chilling back at that Dorsey house about five miles away. And we're going to talk a lot about acoustic shadows in this episode because mm-hmm. that's a huge part of this. Because of all the undulations that roll throughout Perryville, he can't hear. And that's this is going to be a repeating thing for him. So when they start, when he hears the battling, the firing, his first instinct is, who the hell's firing? You're wasting powder. He thinks it's just them practicing. He, he's like, they're practicing. So by sunrise on the 8th, Artillery's blasting away, boom, 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 on that rebel positions, primarily guns from the second Minnesota Light Artillery. So they're firing, they're firing. The fifth Arkansas under Lucius Featherstone in uh, Gillespie's seventh Arkansas, they're going to reform, they're going to try to take that hill now, right? So this is kind of the beginning of the battle. They're going to hit that, they're going to try to take that hill, they're going to be pounded by canister fire from guns on Peters Hill. But you know what? They keep coming, they keep mm-hmm. doing it. Once they get close to the guns, Daniel Cook's infantry, the 85th and 86th Illinois, and that 52nd Ohio we talked about, 
they're going to rise up and they're going to blast um, these Arkansas guys from less than 100 yards with a volley. And they're going to stop them in their tracks. They're going to run faster down that hill than the time it takes you to stick a key in the side of a Labatt's can. That's how fast that it's going to go, right? So they're going to be coming up that hill to retake that hill. And all of a sudden, they're going to rise up with three infantry regiments, and they're going to start firing. And they're going to roll down that hill. So by 10 o'clock in the morning, Braxton Bragg, and we talked about mm -hmm. Braxton Bragg, the commander of the Army of the Mississippi, he's going to finally get there. So there's kind of a pretty good battle going on already. Yeah. He's going to arrive in Perryville and set up his headquarters at a place called the Crawford House along a road called the Harrodsburg Road, yeah. which we'll talk a lot about. And he's pissed because at around, um, there was at some point around 6 a.m., uh, Leonidas Polk had told him that the battle will begin vigorously. But then Polk being Polk, and we've seen him do this before, he changes his mind and he's like, oh, I'm just going to step in a defensive position, probably sits in a rocking chair like he did at Battle Chickamauga. Um, we are definitely going to be hearing about Polk again later. So Bragg shows up there around 10 a.m. and he's like some level of fucking, you know, pissed off, right? And so he rides from Harrodsville to Perryville to take charge. And he's pissed at Polk's battle line because, you know, it's got some gaps in it. It's not properly anchored on the flanks. And Bragg is going to assume that the major threat is at the Springfield Pike, where the attack had happened earlier at Peters Hill. So he orders his army to realign in a north-south line and attack on Echelon. And his plan is to hit them from left, center, right. That's going to hey, be so his... right, right, right down the line. When you hit echelon yep. attack, you, what, you, what you're hoping for in Gettysburg, people, you think of the long street assault mm -hmm. on the July 2nd. You want to keep hitting, 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 hoping the union is going to support and create a gap they're going to break through. So, about you know, by noontime, Leonidas Polk is in his right wing. They're going to, you mentioned before how, how he says how Leonidas Polk is, is, you know, he's set up, but he doesn't do anything. Yeah. Bragg wants, he wants them to start fighting because he sees troops in his front. Okay. So ultimately what's going to happen is, is those troops are going to force Bragg to order Cheatham's, um, Cheatham's first division under Polk along, uh, along a road called the Chaplin road to strike what he thinks is the union left flank, which is going to be a huge mistake. Now mm -hmm. on the union side, Federal cavalry under a guy named Ebenezer Gay. I know you like talking about him because so we have a story for him. He has troopers from guys in Kentucky, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Minnesota. This is interesting because he is sent to go in the woods near the Peters Hill in a place called Bottom Hill to clear yeah. out any Rebs who might be whittling in the woods. So that's what he's pretty <laughs> much what he's going to do. Now, Gay is going to get pissed off at this. Ebenezer Gay, the cavalry guy, he's going to get pissed. He's going refuse to refuse the order unless he gets infantry support. Okay, he doesn't know what's in the woods. This, I mean, this he, probably he's afraid of clowns. clowns. Realistically, probably, probably a clown, probably was, a right? snake. But the thing that's interesting, he's going to complain to his to the corps commander general Gilbert and say, "Listen, I'm I need infantry support I, before I go in there." Now, Gay, as you can imagine, is going to be told, "Get your ass in the woods," and that's what's going to happen. The corps mm -hmm. commander is going to trump him. So, Gay and his merry men, you see what I did there, Mary. <laughs> he 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 will approach the woods as soon. Um, and as soon as they get there, the thing is, they're going to get into these woods and rebel muskets are going to open up on them from, from Liddell's Arkansas men. We're going to talk about Liddell here in a little while, right? Um, and it's interesting to see how this, this kind of goes, this early phase of this battle of Perryville. Gay is going to send his dismounted second Michigan men forward into the woods to deal with these Arkansas guys that are in his front. Now, Gay, his troopers in the second Michigan, they're going to have repeaters. Right. And so they're going to charge into the woods and they're going to run right into the teeth of Liddell's brigade. Now, yeah. what the Rebs will do is they'll do a classic rope a dope. Well, they'll fall back like they're going to retreat and they're going to lead them into a trap. So they're going to reform and they're going to wait for them and they're going to blast them as they approach, send them off, taken off. So Ebenezer Gay's attack into the woods is going to basically fail because they're going to get tricked by these um, these Arkansas guys on the Liddell. Yeah. And then the other thing that's happening too is Bragg is bringing up, starting to bring up reinforcements since it's around noon. So while this is all happening, that Claiborne gets an order to um, form up in a line battle east of Harrodsburg and Perryville Road. Now he's a little bit away, so he's not going to come into this until two thirty, and not going to be engaged till around right. three. But no, but we're yeah. true. But we, we still have the morning to talk about. No, but... I know we do. <laughs> no. I know. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so, you know, but one guy, no, you know. I know I'd like to talk about is Phil Sheridan. So yeah. Sheridan 
by early to mid morning now. So he's going to realize, you know, that he's going to need a bigger boat to support Gaze Calvary. And, into, and he's going to find troops in the 35th Brigade under Bernard Leibolt, who is interesting, Mary, because he's a guy from Germany. Um, who we've talked a lot about with your 11th Corps people, right? Yes. But he's a different guy. He emigrates to uh, to St. Louis when he was six years old. Um, who knows if he had a bad first grade, sixth grade picture too. The bad haircut in sixth grade, we don't know, but we can assume he probably did. Sixth grade, and it wasn't my choice. Leibolt's <laughs> been mostly from Missouri and Illinois, right? And what they're going to do is they're going to go ahead and they're going to charge forward and scatter those Liddell's Arkansas guys and is going to force them to leave the dance floor and will basically leave Peters and Bottoms Hill to Sheridan's guys. So the first mm -hmm. phase for the most part, it kind of, it's a dance. It goes back and forth and back yep. and forth. But at the end of the day, um, they are going to control, at least for that moment, we're talking eight, maybe nine o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. the union's going to control Peters and Bottoms Hill. Yeah. And this battle too is a lot like um, Chickamauga in the sense that it, it seems to spill from room to room to room. So you have a different fight going, like it's just like a bar room brawl that just keeps going and going and going and rolling along this line. Um, but yeah, the, this area in the morning, like the union's gonna control that for a few hours, that Peter's Hill. But it's interesting, but just because, you know, this, this whole thing, like most of these battles is command control errors. Now you mentioned Polk mm -hmm. earlier, right? Bragg's telling him, okay, there's these, these troops in our front, I want you to hit them. And he just kind of looks at him and nods, yeah. okay? But then he, you know, he, he Bragg walks out there and pulls out his F this card and ignores <laughs> the entire order, right? So what he ends, ultimately ends up doing, you kind of alluded to this, he's going to put his divisions of, of, of Benjamin Cheatham, William Hardy, Pat Anderson, and Simon Balver Buckner kind of in this defensive wait and see position. Mm -hmm. He's basically saying, and this is on the northern slope of the, of the battlefield here. He's kind of saying, listen, I don't know what the hell's in front of me. I don't know what they're doing. Let's just kind of chill and see what happens. This guy wants us to attack. We don't know who's on our front. We got hills and undulations. We don't know what's on the other side of the frigging things. Let's just kind of play it cool. So um, the, that first attack over the water uh, at Peters and Bottom Hill, at this point is basically over, right? Yeah. So if looking at phases of the battle, the Union's held that valuable water source. At this moment, they got it, right? Now, Buell, you know, we mentioned before, he's sitting back at the Dorsey house, yep. um, kind of recouping over this, this horse. I don't know if he fell off a horse. He, he say, I think he fell off a horse is what happened. Whatever yep. happened, yep, he, he did. He fell off a horse, right? hurt his leg. You know, um, and he's sitting back at that house and he's trying to think, all right, um, he's kind of devising a plan. You know, if he had a mustache, he'd be rubbing the side of it. Some sort of <laughs> evil thing About how I'm going to attack this Braxton Bragg's 15,000 guy army, who he still thinks is not engaging yet because he doesn't mm -hmm. hear the battle yet. Um, he decides he's going to attack around 10 o'clock in the morning um, on that day. He's like, you know, we'll do it around then. But again, his troops weren't ready. They still had their no. feety pajamas on. It was really <laughs> apparently, okay. And so for whatever reason, too, is the orders that he gives to his first and second corps guys, McCook and Thomas Crittenden, didn't get there till late. So they're not in position. So 10 o'clock yeah. comes, they ain't freaking ready, right? Now, no. the, thing, the thing is, though, is Buell, he... And we mentioned this just a second ago, he still doesn't know the battle's going on. So nope. he thinks he thinks he's he's like that little cartoon of the little dog. This is this is fine. The fire's yep. on around. Yeah, this is fine. Right. But he doesn't under know that, that despite the fact that he's making this battle plan, really for that for that day or the next day, he's completely and utterly oblivious to the battle going on. So around noontime, the commander of the first division of Alexander McCook's first corps, a guy named Lovell Rousseau. Yep. He's going to order his 17th Brigade under a poet, Mary. I don't know if you've heard of this guy. His name is William Haynes Lytle. Okay. Now we'll talk about him in detail here in a little while, but I'm just, yep. like you're saying a little while ago, we're trying to set up the, the, the chessboard here, right? Speaking of, we'll talk about Claiborne too. See yep. what he did there? Mm -hmm. nice. And so he's going to set up that battle line near the bot near a place called the HP Bottom House along, um, along a, a, a Michigan battery called Loomis's Battery. And he's kind of setting up his, his line as well. Now, Rousseau is back with Buell reporting on how he's placed his division. He's just mm -hmm. reporting how he's done it. Lytle's men are, are going to sit around. They're going to be chilling. They're just going to be hanging out. Um, who knows what they're doing? You know, just, just sitting, on, <laughs> sitting on the hill. So, you know, maybe they were kung fu fighting. Who knows what they were doing? But they were just kind of <laughs> hanging out there, right? But Lytle is probably Rousseau, reading poetry to them. Probably. Rousseau is going to get reports from his scouts that rebels are moving towards his front along that Harrodsburg Road. 
And what he's going to do at this point, he's going to order some troops to go down to Doctor's Creek, where the water is, and go fill up their canteens. Now, before they do this, a couple things. The water is disgusting at this point. Okay? It's covered in it's, algae and everything it's, else. It's, and there's reports that after the battle, men died from drinking it. There's a, there's a lot of it. It's a lot of stuff. We'll talk yeah. about that. So um, 1230, just after lunchtime. Rebel artillery is going to open up on that Union line with four batteries, and that completely surprised Rousseau. He was not ready mm -hmm. for it. And what he'll do is he'll respond by bringing up the rest of Loomis's mission artillery, along with the 5th Indiana Light Artillery. So he's going to set up his artillery here. And this is going to lead to about a full hour back and forth artillery going back and forth, which doesn't freaking do anything because they, they just, nope. it just there's no damage done, right? No. And yeah, go ahead. I was gonna, and what's Lytle doing? Lytle at this point is riding up and down the line on his horse, preparing his men for that anticipated rebel attack that he mm -hmm. thinks and knows is probably coming. Yep. He's going to set up that third Ohio in a nearby cornfield we'll talk about in a little bit with the rest of his brigade. He's going to set up that second battle line. Yeah. Um, and this is happening all around 2.30 p.m. Am I getting that right? Um, yeah, come the floor. I better say it's yeah. Time. Yeah, but yeah, lunch. he's gonna he's gonna set them up in that line. And there's there's stuff happening all at the same time at the Union, like all along the Union line, there's stuff happening. And also at this time is when Cheatham begins his bombardment at 12:30 from his position. Right. Because Bra Bragg, I was saying Bragg is sitting back at the Crawford house waiting for Polk's offensive attack yep. that we know is not coming now. He's just sitting waiting for it. This is gonna be great. Everybody listen. Nope. Never comes, right? Nope. No. Kind of like a Friday night when you wait. When long story, long. <laughs> but he and, sets. But the one problem too is Confederate cal cavalry recon had been so shitty, um, and that they withdrew where Cheatham from with where Cheatham was. The the cavalry withdraws before they can see McCook place artillery under Lieutenant Charles Parsons and his brigade of General William Al R. Terrell onto Open Knob, which is a prominent hill at the northern end of the battlefield. And this is wow. happening as Cheatham is doing his artillery bombardment at 1230. So he's got no idea that's happening. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, we mentioned the, 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 the recon, you know, Bragg is going to report that the Union line is extended now. He's finally yeah. starting to get some kind of reconnaissance. So this is when he moves at Cheatham's first division, to your point, into that Walker's Bend and John Wharton's cavalry. And he wants to kind of screen their movements and kind of, and kind of protect them. So Probably around two o'clock now, getting there on that time. Loomis's mission and battery artillery is um is out of ammo. Right? They yep. nothing left. Plum out, right? And this is after that hour-long artillery barrage, while Lytle's brigade, his infantry brigade, is still in position waiting for that rebel infantry attack. So the two, Cheatham's guys, are gonna finally attack on the rebel right, followed by Hardy and then Buckner, who at this point, Mary, they're enjoying like a three-to-one man advantage. I mean, this yeah. is a heavy, heavy. On paper, going in, it's a, it's a it's a huge union number disparity, but it doesn't turn out that way, right? No. The first brigade is Cheatham's division to move ahead is the first um, is on a Daniel Don Donaldson's Tennesseans. Yeah, um, he's who Fort Donaldson is named after. Um, yes. and he crosses the Chaplin River and he climbs the bluffs of the West Bank. And as he's going in, Cheatham is saying, "Give him hell, boys." And Donaldson quickly figures out he's attacking the Union Center and not the left. Well, that's the that's the key to the whole thing. Yeah. Is at this point, Polk is fully expecting that this line he's hitting is the left flank. And it's important because guess what? It ain't, right? It's not. He's doing it, a full-on frontal assault right now. And what, what's so funny about that is you mentioned that give him hell boys, cheat him is yelling, give him hell boys. Polk is there, right? Yeah. And he hears him yell that. And him being the bishop won't swear. So after Cheatham yells, give him hell, boys, Cheatham yells, give him what Cheatham said. And he wouldn't say hell, <laughs> yes. right? Which I always thought was a funny story. The heat of battle, he still won't swear. So I don't you know. Just do what but, Cheatham told you to do. Exactly. And, and so the thing that um, Donaldson does is he's going to send out in front um, a guy named Colonel John H. Savage. Now, there's a wicked name for you right there, Savage. Um, and he races ahead of these two other regiments to get to the oh. artillery of Captain John Sam Samuel J. Harris. The thing with Savage is he hates Donaldson and he considers Donaldson to be a drunk and he's not great militarily. Um, he believed that Donaldson's order for him to attack Harris Spattery to be a death sentence against him. And uh -huh. so, and Savage was kind of like Leonidas Polk. He paid little attention to orders anyway, but he is going to go in there and he's moving west, and they come under the crossfire of the 33rd Ohio Infantry, 
the eight guns of Parsons artillery and open knob 200 yards to the north. And then this is when Cheatham orders the brigade of General George E. Manny to go forward to deal with Parsons on open knob. Right. And so Parsons' guns are at this point, they're going to be in jeopardy. That 33 Brigade commander, William Terrell, to your point, James Jackson's 10th Division. Um, he's going to order a bayonet charge to slow Manny down. He's going to try to slow yeah. him down, and they're going to get wicked pounded, suffered greatly, took heavy casualties, and was in vain um, because Manny was able to take Parsons' artillery, right? Now, the thing about Manny is he was a he was a maniac because he wouldn't stop there. He kept going. No. He, so after securing the guns, they keep they go down the reverse slope of that open knob you just mentioned and ran head into that 28th Brigade under a guy named John Starkweather, right? Yep. Who had set up in that cornfield we mentioned. Now, some of Starkweather's soldiers were so new, they'd been in the army for less than 30 days. That's the how 20, new they were. The 21st Wisconsin, I think, is the one that is in the cornfield, and they're so new they don't even have a battle flag yet now one of the guys who was attacked and one of the, the regiments who was attacking at this point was the first tennessee now um everyone knows sam, private sam watkins right yep. from the uh, the ken Burst. he was a guy who was the first tennessee he wrote that um that book company h a side show to the yep. big show um from columbia tennessee and he 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 had um he had a really t amazing quote about this this part of the battle I'm going to read. So I'm going to read here. And what he's saying, he goes, at 12 o'clock, we were marching in a cornfield. The beginning of the end had come. From one end of the line to the other seemed to be a solid sheet of blazing smoke and fire. From the from this moment, the battle was a mortal struggle. Two lines confronted us. We did, we did not recoil, but our line was fairly hurled back by the leaden ball that poured into our very faces. Eight color bearers were killed as they discharged their cannons. So this is heavy, heavy fighting that's going on right at this spot. Now, one of Starkweather's regiments, the 21st Wisconsin, yes, Allie K, Wisconsin again, there you go, <laughs> for her, right? Long story, but, the, but they're in, they were in position, they were one of those regiments that had less than 30 days as well. Yeah, and they they're in position when William Terrell, a brigade commander, runs by them in yep. full retreat, yelling, "The rebels are coming! The rebels are coming! The rebels right? are advancing rebels in are, terrible I think, force!" I think, I, think, I think it was advancing, but it's more fun to make fun of Paul right here. But yeah. but you can imagine them; these are thirty day paper guys, just just in line, and their brigade guys taken off. And the twenty first is commanded by a guy named William Sweet. Okay, yeah. Now, to his credit. He does not run and stood and fired a volley to the oncoming rebels from Maney's brigade, right? Maney, of course, responds by firing a volley of 1,400 muskets into the faces of the 21st Wisconsin yeah. that sent them running down that bent road, which is a, yeah. that road. So give them credit. They were green. They stayed and fired a volley, but they ain't stupid either. I can't imagine how they felt when they, they saw Terrell running back. And by this point, Donaldson is basically done. He is going to suffer 20% casualties. Now within that, um, Savage's men, uh -huh. he loses 219 of 370. And I did the math and I believe it did it correctly. That's 59% casualties. He lost a lot of guys and the fighting at this point, which is, which is that maelstrom, a knockdown drag out type of battle. And it's some of the most vicious fighting in the entire American civil war. Yeah. Um, and it goes on Alexander Stewart's Tennessee mm -hmm. brigade. Yep. He's going to jump into the battle at this point and join the attack on Starkweather. So yep, again, he'll fill in the gap where Donaldson was. Right. And that rebel wave is going to get to the crest just beyond open knob and was able to take that one too. So they're going forward and forward and forward. Terrell and his 33rd Union Brigade was going to try to counterattack to their credit. He, he runs, but he comes back. So he, he kind of yep. doesn't pull Oh, Howard here. He comes back now. Okay. <laughs> he's going to counterattack, after, but he's after he finally stops running. And he's going to get morally wounds by an artillery shell at this point. We'll talk about him in more of a yep. detail later. But the Union is going to fall back to more of a defensive position this time along that Mackville Road instead of some guns on a ridge that was protected by a rock wall. So they're going to yep. kind of set up a defense. They realize what's going on. Maney and Stewart are going to try to attack that rock wall three times over a three-hour period yep. to try to take that position. Um, but they couldn't do it. There's a soldier who was part of that. And I have another quote. He writes, the ground was slippery with blood. Many a poor, dark-looking, powder-grimed artillery man was laying stretched out upon the ground around us, torn and mutilated. This is a rebel soldier talking about one of those Union guys up at that rock wall at the artillery. Yeah. So yeah. what does that tell you? It means they're up there with the guns, these soldiers. Exactly. 
Right. And it said that this part of the battle, that this assault of Maney's brigade, um, as you said, like it's the bloodiest in the battle, but the, his final repulse is described as probably the high watermark of the Confederacy in the Western theater. That's the quote, the high watermark. You yeah. know? And as this is going on, and this is where it kind of has that Chickamauga kind of thing. Yeah. As Polk's attack is on, is on full banana on the rebel right, the attack is also beginning on the rebel center now, right? So it's kind of moving down the yeah. line. So we're talking three o'clock in the afternoon now. Mm -hmm. Colonel Thomas Jones, Mississippi guys, and Patton Anderson's mm -hmm. division, um, part of Hardy's left wing, begins to move in that, into the battle, into that valley, right? In a um, same, they, they're near the sinkhole. What's cool? But what's great sinkhole. about this, though, is they, they YOLO this. They do this yeah. without orders. They just, they do it on their that own. That happens a lot in this battle. Like, it seems like, you know, I'm reading the names of, like, I got to, when I was researching this, I got to know the names of a lot more colonels than I usually do. And mm -hmm. I think that's because how, you know, distant, you know, literally and figuratively Buell is from this battle. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like the soldiers are are having to take the things under their own and be like, okay, this is what we need to do because we're not getting mm -hmm. any orders and they're, they're coming right at us. And, you know, in some instances, that is what happens at uh, Battle of Chickamauga as well, because you have the, um, you know, the brigades are separated from their division commanders and all that, right? So similar things are happening here too. But I really found like, if, you know, you hear the names of a lot more colonels in this making the decisions. But you know what they do, Mary? They march right into the teeth here. They do. They're going to march right straight into fire from those 12 guns on the ridge line and a bunch of musket fire by Leonard Harris's 9th Brigade that you mentioned earlier. So they're going to yeah. go right into it. There's going to be an artillery duel that's going to go on between the 5th Indiana and Charles Lumsden's Alabama guns. Um, but again, it does no real damage to either side. Um, but Jones' brigade does get does get driven back. Yeah. So they're going to try and yeah. they're going to fall back. So now you're talking about 4 o'clock now, right? Mm -hmm. The funny Thomas thing Jones about this... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. No, I was going to say Thomas... Go ahead. No, go ahead. I know what you're going to say. Oh, go ahead. No, I was, I was going to say that the interesting thing about this is not only do you have acoustic shadows happening, but you have an mm -hmm. optical illusion happening here as well. So when uh, Captain Charles Lumsden's Alabama Light Artillery goes to return fire... Um, they can't line things up because of an optical illusion. The two ridges looked exactly the same, so they couldn't get the appropriate range on the weapons. So therefore, that's why it didn't really do anything. So this geography is really playing in heavily into how this battle is turning. No, I mean, you can have all the, the French ordnance glasses all you want and those the type of things mm -hmm. to, to help you with your artillery. But if, 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 you're getting, if you're getting that weird eyeball effect thing from, from just the visual stuff, it, it's just pretty tough to do. And you know, so Tom was going to say, so around four o'clock, Thomas Jones troops are going to get replaced by John C. Brown, guys from Florida and Mississippi for the most part. Um, and this, it, it pretty much that very moment when the Union artillery was kind of taking a break to cool the guns off. So they kind of hit the timing just right. Um, but they had no success either. They kind of got pushed back. But you keep sliding down the line, right, with this. Yep. So as you go down the line in that rebel right around the same time, probably about 3, 30, 4 o'clock around the same time, you know, you have Alexander's McCook's you know, corner. What's interesting about this battle for the most part, for the, you don't want to say for the most part, but it's really McCook's core against three Confederate divisions, kind yeah. of. McCook's right? is the worst, I think. Right. And battle. so M McCook's first Union Corps is parked on a ridge near the house of a place called Squire Henry Bottom, right? Yep. Now, on McCook's right flank is where Lytle is. That 17th Brigade is placed at that place at the, at the bottom house. That's where, that's where he is, we mentioned earlier. And Lytle had sent, like I said earlier, Lytle had sent some of his guys down by the creek. That's what they say in the South there. It's yep. creek. We okay. call them cricks here too. Down at the creek, um, down it's basically a ravine at Doctors Creek to fill in those canteens, and it's going to be the 42nd Indiana under a guy named Gerard Jones, right? Mm -hmm. While they're down there, they're filling up their green, crappy canteens with this no, shitty thank water. You. No, thank they're going to start to take fire from the 14th Battalion of the Louisiana Sharpshooters on a guy named Major John Stone Cold Austin. That was just John. <laughs> Be amazing just, oh my god a, yeah, there's that? a wrestling um, reference for our wrestling fans out there is, is that john ross's theme music <laughs> that, that's what uh that's probably what, what uh, that'd be amazing probably saying. but they're down there filling up their water and they're starting to take shots these pot shots from mm -hmm. these sharpshooters under austin right these louisiana guys now the sound of the fire pop 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 is gonna just like the walking dead it's gonna attract right yeah and what who does that attract it attracts bushrod johnson the commander of the third brigade under buckner yeah his division 
to say something's going on at the old at the old uh, that area. So we better head down there. So they're going to advance to that bottom house area from the Chatham House Hill. They're going to come down to an area now. The Rebs are going to move. They're going to cross Stonewall after Stonewall. They're going to get there, and they're going to start raining artillery on that Union position. Right mm -hmm. now, there was a, you know, it, it, there's a, there, was, there was a story about a barn. I think it was a barn, either barn or yep. farmhouse. It was yep, right it was near barn. there. Yep. Where, where the Third Ohio and the Fifteenth Kentucky guys who were injured were resting. Right, yep. and the barn caught fire. And they all burned to death, which is a really crappy story, but it's just one of those things. Um, yeah. But the the third Ohio at this point in the 15th Kentucky are going to ultimately go in. The third third Ohio is going to fall back. The 15th Kentucky is going to go yep. in. Is how it's going to go. The 15th Kentucky is under a guy named Colonel Curran Pulp. Um, and what was what was interesting about it, so they ends up basically it was around it was while this was all going out just kind of think of the household thing goes this is when patrick claiborne's guys start coming yeah bro was interesting about claiborne marries a couple things one a lot of his guys had blue jackets on because they stole them yeah. from union soldiers yep. the jackets and the pants on that they taken from richmond and that's really going to uh not help them in a little while when they go into battle but the other thing too i just thought of is you have men starting to trade off now you know you have this 15th kentucky coming in trading off for the guys that were there before but you have Claiborne come coming into this uh, battle and he's going to have to relieve Johnson's men because Johnson and Claiborne have a little bit of a chat when they get on the battlefield and Johnson's like yeah dude I'm running out of ammo can you continue oh, all I could think about with these blue jacket Claiborne guys these guys going in yeah like all the Confederates pointing at them going that's the red shirted guys from Star Trek they're going in right now. yeah exactly that, that's kind of exactly exactly <laughs> yeah. what it was because you had to think because they were taking fire from both sides of this point yeah. <laughs> think about it so Claiborne he's going to ride in and while he's on moving up and on that slope he's his horse is going to get hit his horse Dixie yeah by an artillery shell by all accounts kind of blew the horse up right must have been a yeah. direct shot and this is going to injure him as well um he's going to get hit in the ankle by some sort of artillery piece going to hurt him not sure if it affected his chess playing game mary admittedly <laughs> i don't know idea i don't um, think it did you know but Claiborne's men are going to, they're going to be marching up that slope towards that 15th Kentucky now, who's replaced the third Ohio. Yeah. And what, what was, you mentioned Bushrod a second ago was, mm -hmm. was a great story about this battle. Bushrod's guys are there. Claiborne, Kool-Aid mans it, goes right past them. Oh, he does. Out he, of the freaking way. Yeah, yeah he does. Like, the way he sets them up. So what he does is he's, he puts his like skirmishers out in front and he puts his other men like, you know, so like maybe 10 or so paces behind because he sees how the geography is. He recognizes that where the federals are, they're not going to be able to open up fire on them till a certain point. So um, as the skirmishers crest over this hill, the union opens fire on them and there's the casualties are heavy. But then right after that, this is when Claiborne and his men basically Kool-Aid man it in there. And as the union are, are loading their rifles, the Confederates, Claiborne's men just fire a volley at them of less than a hundred yards. And then they just, they rush in and Hardy would write of this part of the battle. He would say of Claiborne that it was irresistible and drove the enemy in wild disorder from a position nearly a mile to the rear. Um, and this is a funny quote I found from one of Claiborne's men he said, as their line broke, we had them and gave it to them in the back. It was a hot evening and the grass being dry. It caught fire and the flames Ooh. spreading to a barn. <laughs> just to right. so they're savannah you, they're 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 given uh, the savannah to uh you know, the, the union here to, to digress real quick do you know that after this battle that night of the eighth there was that they have we'll talk about the council of war that Bragg has yeah. you know bushra how pissed off he was at claiborne for pushing past him there's a confrontation it was like 19th yeah. century road rage you cut me off he yeah, was so pissed at claiborne for basically pushing past his guys and going right through them, which I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in that conversation. Oh, yeah. well, then apparent, oh, and then apparently after that, I think it was Claiborne who said, we're not going to speak of this anymore. Yeah, he said, not enough of this. <laughs> he was you know, like, fuck this. You know, <laughs> but speak. so, so go back to the middle. So, so, you know, the, the union troops are going to, are going to, are going to, at this point, Claiborne's going to be going in. Um, they're marching up that slope towards the 15th Kentucky, who been who got some support now from three companies from, from yep. all these Ohio guys, Mary. Now, on the left was a second brigade of Louisiana men under Daniel Adams, right? Now, the Union troops are 
At this point, they'd be forced to retreat while William Lytle um, continues to rally his troops. And this is when he's, we talked about this before, but it was around now he's going to get hit in the head with something. Artillery is going to get nicked. And he's going to be left for dead by his troops, right? Yep. And he'll be captured, befriended by Bushrod Johnson, would care for him. He would arrange for an early parole back to the Union yep. Army right after the battle. And they'd see each other again in Chickamauga under less friendly terms, they would. But Much but less. this is, we. I would refer to you, Mary, to our episode of William Haynes Lytle for further details about this part. Yes. That's he and was, Bushra, so. Bushrod hang out in their no. feety pajamas for a while. No, they were. So <laughs> j- just south of this, while this is all rolling, so it's all kind of rolling southwest on this battle line is what it yep. is. Phil Sheridan's second division in Gilbert's Corps was just hanging out near the Peters Hill. Uh, and even though they were close to that bottom house and could clearly see and hear what was going on with Lytle, they did not come to his assistance because he yeah. was ordered by Gilbert not to bring on a general engagement. And he'd, he'd occasionally fire a few shells, but that's all he would do. Now, no one showered in like you do. Can you imagine how hard that must have been for him to sit there? Oh, for him nothing? to sit still? Yeah, this is one of those things that's kind of an anomaly in who Sheridan is because he's known as this really aggressive commander especially near the end of the civil war but here you have him just like okay I'll follow orders oh wait I just need to fire a few he had to he must have been like just bouncing off the walls and he's told he can't do it he had orders you know and uh and that was that what but one thing real quick before we we, we exit the 15th Kentucky we got to talk about uh Colonel Pope who talked real quick about this water Mm -hmm. so he gets wounded in this battle right with against Claiborne's guys he's going to survive it but you know what happens to him? Mm. He's drinking that water. You know what yep. happens? He gets typhoid because yep. of the water, the shitty water. He dies and he's going to die later. on the 6th of November, 1862, as many soldiers do. And this, again, because of desperation of thirst, because of the heat, they're forced to drink this crap, kind of like the stuff you drank, right? You know, that Molson X crap. <laughs> Ew, and, and you have a lot You have a lot of these people, a lot of these soldiers. And this is a very under- studied, I don't say understudy, but under thought about part of this battle. You think about the battles, like canister fire, artillery, mm-hmm. and musketry. These poor guys are thirsty as hell drinking this crap pond scum water. And guys like Colonel Pope is going to die of typhoid because yeah. of it. It's just one of those things, you know, but well, that's something that happens throughout the Civil War. You hear it even, you know, around the time of the Battle of Shiloh, men getting typhoid and dying because they're drinking this really shitty water, right? And it's just like, ugh. I can't even imagine. I don't know why I'm thinking of Typhoid Mary right now, but that's obviously, <laughs> you know. Anyway, so at four o'clock in the afternoon with Mary, you know who finally gets into the battle is all Phil Sheridan. He gets dragged mm-hmm. into the battle. He finally does. Yeah. Um, uh, through a, a brigade of rebels under Samuel Powell is going to line up on Claiborne's left, which is basically in Claiborne's front. And he's going to get orders to move along toward a road called the Springfield Pike to a Union battery that has been causing them problems under a guy named Henry Hescock. Yeah. Have fun with that name, Barry. So I'm glad you Bra- pronounced that one and not me. All right. So, so Bragg wants that battery taken out. He's just, it's causing him a lot of problems, take it out. But he assumes those guns are just by themselves. They're yeah, not the entire guns. third corps. He just doesn't a, realize they're just entire lemonade, third lemonade stand all by itself and nobody <laughs> around. That's kind of what they're thinking, right? And, and they're not supported by infantry. And guess what? Oops, they were, right? Yeah. It's a, it's actually attached to Gilbert's third corps and had full support. So Powell's Rebs go in with just three regiments, three, mm-hmm. right? And they go straight to the teeth of, of Sheridan's waiting division who slapped them around pretty quickly. That was pretty easy. Now, the thing about this, Mary, is for whatever reason, these three regiments under Powell, right? They're going to retreat. Powell, I mean, Sheridan doesn't counterattack no, for whatever he reason had, he does he hesitates this is not his best day here at all no and, and he says he's waiting for support from, from that from from william carlin's 31st brigade and robert mitchell's 9th division who finally did come and chase powell's retreating regiment so you got robert mitchell his 9th division is going to show up and they're they're going to be the ones who are going to chase these three regiments in um carlin's brigades are going to and this this is pretty good because Carlin's brigades are going to chase Powell, basically chariots of fire style, Yeah, right? They're going to chase him all the way back into Perryville. And, and the run, it, it, they go so, it's, they, they ran so fast, I cannot believe Howard was not involved there. That's how fast they were running. But, <laughs> Nike was their but a, sponsor though, which is the official sponsor but, of the 11th But Corps. a soldier in the 15th Wisconsin, okay? Mm-hmm. He wrote about this pursuit. He wrote, it was like running a marathon, the enemy ahead, the enemy had it, and we, and we were in pursuit. At times, we were so close, I was once able to slap a rebel in the rear. 
Ooh, Ooh there's exactly. a lot of so, rear action in this battle. So there was, definitely was. But that's how, how, they, how, how they were. So um, the primary part of the battle that most people study is the, is the final leg of this, which is the Alexander McCook stuff at the Wrestle House, right? Yeah. So by late afternoon, McCook's first corps, um, the Rebs are going to, what they're going to try to do is they're going to attack both flanks of Alexander McCook's and they're going to use that pincer to double development thing. Yep. They're going to hit their flanks. And they're going to push them back and they want to drive McCook's men back to an intersection where these, where a road called the Benton road and the Mackville road meet at a place called Dixville crossroads. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, great name. Ideally they're, <laughs> they'd be able to separate them from the rest of Buell's army to kind of separate them and, and just defeat them yeah. right there. Now, Bragg's first part of this attack was to attack a brigade in James Jackson's 10th division under George Webster. Yeah. And I know there's a story you want to tell about these three guys. Yeah. So these three guys, so Jackson, Webster, and Terrell get together the night before and they're all like, okay, what are the odds? So they're, you know, working out the math by what, what are the chances that they're, they could all be killed or one of them killed or whatever. And they determine just from the numbers and whatever the fuck their kind of calculations they're doing that it's really, really low. All three of them are going to die in this battle. Jackson first, mm -hmm. followed by Turrell, followed by Webster. And that's the Webster's the final senior loss in this 10th division. Um, but they all get taken out after being like, nope, the odds are really in our favor that we're not going to die in this battle. Yeah, they're all sitting on the campfire like a bar talk, just cock. Yeah. What, what do you think? It's like just just imagine that the conversation these guys have, you know, and, and you know when the battle does happen the next day, this is this this had not happened the night before. Bragg's assault was by Simon Baldwin Buckner's third division under that third brigade under the aforementioned Sterling A. M. Wood. Right now, during this assault, Wood will rise to the occasion, Mary, and this <laughs> yes, is what this does. is what you know, this is what George Webster is going to be killed as does division commander James Jackson and William Terrell. They're all going to get mortally wounded. Yep. Um, uh, and that's how it's, I, th I think Webster gets killed. The other two get mortally wounded. I think yeah, yeah, because um, Terrell dies around 2 a.m. And I think Jackson mm -hmm. might be one of the higher ranking officers killed at Perryville as well. Yeah, yeah. But Wood is going to take a beating at the hands Ooh. of Webster's infantry. <laughs> from, God, from, they're going to, anyway, what should I say around you? But they're, they're going to get slapped around in from that Union battery that's situated near Benton Road. So they're trying to pinch them and drive them in, but they're still dealing with this artillery. So Wood's going to renew his attack. And this time he was able to, he was able to, God, I'm afraid to say this. He's, he's going to penetrate the line. Okay. And he's going to, he's going to drive Webster's men back to that Benton, Benton and Mackville Road, right? Now, eventually Wood is going to fall back as another brigade arrives. This is the brigade of St. John Liddell's brigade who was fighting again. Here they are again on the other part of the battlefield. Interesting thing about Liddell, Mayor, I don't know if you studied him, but St. John Richardson Liddell's an interesting fellow. He's um, from a wealthy Louisiana family. He um, has a very epic name. He does, but you know what he was? He was a very outspoken supporter of guess what? Emancipation of the slaves in the Confederacy. And he felt that if, he, if they freed the slaves, it would open the door to foreign intervention on the South's behalf. And he he was an outspoken, big mouth, would not stop talking type of guy, right? Oh. And, but he was also, he all, unlike Patrick Claiborne, mm -hmm. who got blackballed for this, he yeah. was a former classmate of guess who? Jefferson Davis, ah. right? So he was kind of in so the pocket, why, right? Yeah. And so it kept him in the Reds graces. Now, whenever he was offered a promotion, Liddell turned it down every time. Nope. Don't want to, oh. you know, he was a, he was a motivated fellow, right? But he was, he had a lot of money. He was able to raise and support his own brigade and he's mm -hmm. happy with it and just, and just kept it. He hated, hated Judah Benjamin with a passion. I don't know if it was Asia Booth related. We don't know, okay? <laughs> but, and, but af, after the war, he, write, he wrote a set of <laughs> memoirs, which bashed all of them. Bash Braxton Bragg. He blamed Bragg for all the subordinates' failures. He was he was that guy. He just wow. whatever. The other thing about him, you're the Hatfields and the McCoys. Yeah. The fa he his family was involved in one called the Liddell Jones feud. Whoa. Okay, there was a few they had with some family. Uh, that just doesn't with, sound uh, as good though. It doesn't. It doesn't. So after the war in 1870, this thing's been going on for a while. Liddell is going to be on a boat in New Orleans. And who's going to get on the boat but Charles Jones and his sons? Guess what happens? 
he kills him. So Liddell gets killed on a boat in 1870 in New Orleans because of a family feud by Charles Jones and his sons. Wow. Just, a, just It's just one of those stupid stories. Yeah, it's no, that's one. cool, though. That's what's interesting about studying yeah. this is you find out about all this background that's going on, you know? Oh, yeah. So yeah. Getting, getting back to the battle. Right? <laughs> so McCook is going to ask Sheridan at this point. He's going to see what's going on. He's going to ask Sheridan to send support on his right flank. He's like, like, I'm getting my right flank is getting driven in. Can you help me out? So he, uh, he also sends an aide to Charles Gilbert, the Corps commander, to get help from this, his third corps as well. Because now this is really going now, right? Gilbert, in true passing the buck form, is going to refer a staff officer to go um, to go to Buell for his headquarters for this yep. request, which is about five miles away from the battlefield at Dorsey House. The staff officer won't get there for about an hour later. So Buell is sitting in his headquarters. Okay, God knows what he's doing. And... He gets the request, and at this moment, he finally says, shit, there's a battle going on? This is when he realizes <laughs> like this is going on. in the on, afternoon. Right? And so he blamed the acoustic shadow, which is probably true. Yeah. But I can only imagine what it must have been like when he had his want to get away moments when he yep. realized this battle was going on, and he missed the whole thing. And so um, – but what this acoustic shadow did with Buell not knowing, you know, the, Ar- the Union Army went into this battle – you know, with 55,000 guys, yep. there were 40, there was 35 to 40,000 soldiers who were not put in this battle no. because Buell didn't know there was a battle. No. So even though the, even though Bragg was outnumbered 55,000 to about 15,000, the numbers were almost the same because Buell didn't know there was a battle and didn't send everybody yeah. in. Could you imagine the cutscenes and or the, the scenes in a movie about Perryville where you have one scene where like they're this, this bloody battles happening and then it cuts to Buell and he's drinking like he's sipping like a drink out of a pineapple <laughs> in a lounge chair all, all I can picture and there's that, birds that, singing around him and he can't hear shit all I can picture you know is that movie the usual suspects you know when you sit yeah. there you realize what's going on what right yeah but so he finally figures it out and th- this is the part that blows my mind he finally goes oh shit okay I'll send you I'll send you people okay but he only sends two brigades yeah from so now shops. he knows what's going so he's going to send Albion Schmops, who the hell's name is, Shop's name in, right? That yeah. first division um, from under Gilbert, he's going to send him in. And even though he knows the house is completely on fire, the killer is in the house, he yeah. knows. He sits there and he throws a, he shoots a water gun at the fire. That's what he does. Yeah. And I think this, I think what this shows though, is that the, not the complete mass confusion that Don Carlos Buell had at this moment. I don't think he knew what was going on. He had no concept of what was going on. He had no idea the severity of this battle. And more importantly, he had no idea what was going on in his union lines, right? So at this point, the battle's a complete mess. There's smoke covering the, most, of the, most of the field. And this is when my one of my all-time favorite stories, the Civil War, comes up. Is I right was around say. Now. Okay, so this yeah. is all going on. During this confusion, Leonidas Polk, okay, the uh, the fighting bishop, mm-hmm. he he's going to almost get his ass caught. And I, I love yeah. this story. So they're near the Russell House at Alex McCook's headquarters. They're right there, and there's a set of woods. Now Liddell's men, okay, are in are are, are they're firing into a wood line at these un, unseen soldiers, right? And someone from the woods who must be brilliant just yells, for God's sake, stop shooting. You're firing upon your friends. Yeah. And Polk, for whatever freaking reason, is intrigued by this. So he stops the fire and he decides to personally ride to the woods to see who it is. He stumbles into the 22nd Indiana under Colonel Squire Isham Keith. Now, the 22nd was pretending to be Rebs because, my guess, they don't like being shot at. So that's probably yeah. why they did it, right? So Polk rides up. He actually meets Keith. He, me- he actually runs into a face to face, and Polk says to Colonel Heath, um, "You know, you know, who are you guys?" He goes, "Well, we're at the Twenty Second Indiana." So Keith responds back to him, "Who are you?" He responds back, "You'll soon find out." Right? <laughs> who knows if that's true? But that's what Polk yeah. said. It probably did. But Polk had a blue like blouse or overcoat on, so yeah. you couldn't really tell. So Polk realizes okay i'm screwed here right so what does he do he realizes his mistake he's going to ride up and down the line of the 22nd indiana giving out orders <laughs> stop firing move here move there and he's running up and down the line 
until finally he pulls his Irish goodbye and sneaks out and heads back <laughs> in the line. But I just find that fascinating that he was not only he didn't run away, and I hate to say it, but you know, I mean, many a guy, you know, I got I, I can think of um. I can think of one guy specifically over at Chantilly who. who yeah, I was just thinking poor Carney. He, you know, um, Phil Carney probably should have tried that to not work of out well running, him. right? But yeah. he literally is pretending to be an officer. And because yeah. he's wearing a blue blouse thing, no one questions him. And I love the fact he's giving out orders stop shooting, stop shooting. And he finally gets back to the line. He gets back to the line, okay? And when he does, he tells Liddell, he says, Liddell says, who are those guys in the woods? He says, every mother's son in those woods is a Yankee. That's the quote he said, <laughs> right? And so Liddell's guys are firing into the woods and they beat the hell out of them. The 22nd Indiana um, takes 65% casualties from these volleys from what happened from Liddell, including Commander Isham Keith, who was killed here. Mm -hmm. So these, these, these Liddell guys fire into the woods and they completely push out these guys. Now, Polk, I have to think, for whatever reason, Polk did not pursue. After he, he beats these guys in the woods, he steps back. I have to think he lit up a cigarette and just, he just yep. needed to calm his nerves because he almost got caught. He was like Sylvester the cat in that one cartoon where he's got the coffee and the cigarettes going. That's yeah. probably what he was like but for the I, next few but days. I think, I think he was probably shook up pretty hard by uh -huh. this because because he doesn't attack. He decides to halt the attack and pull back at this point, even though he's got him. Yeah. And I have to think he realized that that pucker effect moment he had, I think for the most part, he realized that, okay, I got lucky here. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to stop this. So after this Bragg and his army, of the Mississippi, despite being, uh, being outmanned, found themselves in control of much of the fields. They stuck their hand in their pocket from last year's jacket and pulled out a $20 bill. Look what I found. They, <laughs> they, they realized that they fell upon this. So yeah. Whether it be, and who knows, whether it be the casualty numbers, I have to think though, it was the fact that Thomas Crittenden's second brigade, second corps is still looming out there. Cause you remember Buell had held many of these guys back. Yeah. I think at this point, Bragg decides, you know what? Enough is enough. I think I said, we came, what we came to do. And he decides that he's going to withdraw from the battlefield. Even after driving Buell back and having him on the run, he pumps the brakes and says, the hell with this. Yeah. This, this, this is stupid. So Nine o'clock. This is around this time when Buell has his little thing. I mean, um, when Bushrod has his little issue with Claiborne, probably right yeah. around here. Bragg is going to meet with his generals at the headquarters at the Crawford House, and he's going to give an exodus, a mass exodus of the dance floor. He says, "It's yeah. exactly literally what he called it." <laughs> and and he says, "I want I want everyone out of here by midnight. Yeah. We're going to we're heading back to Tennessee." So yeah. he's going to leave. They leave nine hundred wounded behind. Yeah, I was going to say loud, loud, those thousand people. You read my mind, yeah. Mary. Good job. So his what he wants to do is his plan was to reunite his army back at Harrodsburg and determine what. Um, and he just he, he been pretty much determines at this point that you know what we can't hold Kentucky. This is stupid. We didn't get the recruits we thought we were going to get. We fought. You know, we got pounded. You know, we had a strategic victory. We drove Buell off the field, but we cannot hold this. So he determines on his own after a months of what we talked about, this attack into Kentucky, this, this, this invasion of, of Richmond and all the stuff we talked about, he decides that, we, that this army, this Confederacy cannot take Kentucky. So he's going to leave Kentucky. He's going to go back to Tennessee, literally handing the Commonwealth, Missouri football coach, of yeah. Kentucky back the great to, state. to 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 them, and so they, so for they fought for months politically and military militarily. He gives it all back to Lincoln, which yeah. is a mind numbing situation for Braxton Bragg. Yeah, and then he gets called to Richmond to go to the principal's office with Jefferson Davis, but because they're friends, he gets a pass. Can you imagine the people in Richmond spitting up their grits when they heard this? When they find out what's going on. So he goes back to Richmond and he gets called back. Yep. And Davis Davis wants Bragg, what the friggin' hell? Wants answer for what he did. He's also hearing these stories now of Bragg's subordinates bitching about him. And we talk about him a lot with like Chattanooga, right? Yeah, this is where this it really, it, it starts here. Like Claiborne's men apparently called him cowardly because like Bragg didn't give them any credit for what they did. And, and Claiborne's men had, driven the federals furthest from the field more than any others had that day all because Claiborne no. decides to kool-aid man it in bragg's defense mary okay if he stayed 
until the eighth. I have to think Buell would have brought up Crittenden's second core and the rest of those other yeah. 40,000 guys to pull in and probably drive them. Don't forget, too, the Army of the Mississippi had 15, 16,000 guys, yeah. and they did they did lose – you know, they did lose about 3,300 here, right? So he probably saw the writing on the wall yeah. that maybe it would be like a Shiloh situation. We won this, but we're going to get killed the next day. So that's mm-hmm. probably why he did it. But I'm surprised he pulled all the way He pulled all the way back. Now, many of Davis's cabinet predictably wanted Bragg fired, not yeah. on a rail. Um, but Davis doesn't do it. And what, what Bragg is going to do is he's going to leave Richmond. He's going to pull his army to a place called Murfreesboro, Tennessee, He's going to rest and train his guys again, or eventually he'll be tested again a few months later at the Battle of Stones River in December. So he he's going to ultimately, I think he felt he did what he thought was right. I think he was looking yeah. a little bit forward, but I think he overreacted by, by throwing the baby out with the bathwater here by instead of just backing off and reforming maybe to Versailles where he wanted to fight, yeah. he left completely. Um, Buell, to not endear himself either to this battle. He, he's going to return to Nashville instead of yeah. pursuing Bragg. So he doesn't do anything either. He does kind he's of got, a half-ass pursual, but it's... Well, he, he just, he's just there and, you know, pillow fights him a little bit. Yeah. And I think this, and I think this was, we mentioned before when we talked about the lead up to this, I think this was a, well, it definitely was. It was a final straw for Linky with Buell. Absolutely. He's sick of the slow, deliberate shit. He's going to create the Department of the Cumberland, which will later be called the Army of the Cumberland. He's going to take Buell's Army of the Ohio and put it within within um, that command as the 14th Corps under William Rosecrans, right? So yep. you're going to end up a situation where really neither of these guys endeared themselves. Why Bragg left the state is one of those things. Why Buell did not pursue him and beat that army of the Tennessee at that moment is another mystery. Yeah. And the thing about it, though, is, you know, we talk about this, the casualty numbers. A union had 4,000 casualties. Mm-hmm. The Confederacy had 3,300. On paper... It doesn't sound like a very big battle. It really doesn't. But when you think about the percentages, and I mentioned this, I think, on Twitter, 20.2% casualties combined on both sides, right? This is more than Antietam, which is 20.1, more than Franklin, which was 16, more than Chancellorsville, which is about 16. And it was a situation where it was just a vicious battle. Sam Watkins, again, Mm -hmm. mentioned him, Company H, right? I'm going to read this quote. He writes, after the battle was over, John T. Tucker, Scott Stevens, A.S. Horsley, and I detailed to bring out our wounded that night and helped bring out many poor dying comrades, Joe Thompson, Billy Pond, Byron Richardson, the two Allen boys, brothers killed side by side, and Colonel Patterson was killed standing right next to me. I saw W.J. Whitbourne, then a stripping boy of 15 years old, fall, shot through the neck and collarbone. He fell apparently dead, when I saw him all at once jump up, grab his gun, and commence loading and firing, and hearing him say, damn him, I'll fight him as long as I live. So this guy's dying, literally, and he's still trying to oh fight. Oh, my God. He writes, we, bought, we brought off Captain Loot Irvine. Loot was shot through the lungs, was vomiting blood all the while, and begging us to lay him down and let him die. But Loot is living yet. Also, Lieutenant Woolridge, with both both eyes shot out, I found him rambling, incoherent in a briar patch. I cannot tell the one half or even remember of this late date the scenes of blood and suffering that I witnessed on the battlefield at Perryville. So this one, and he will, he, if you read his com- his Company H diary, yeah. he says, you know, Perryville is the most vicious thing he was ever a part of. He was everywhere. Yeah, and I think when you look at the casualty numbers. You know, 20.2% out of, you know, 36,000 engaged and about 7,800 casualties. Um, it's one that deserves to be studied a lot more because that yeah. had huge ramifications, especially when Kentucky left. And that, that was that was a game-changing situation. It really, really was. That is not really studied, not really, not really appreciated. No, and I mean, and you need to study it to, to understand it. Like just the three episodes that we've covered about it. Um, have really made me understand Kentucky a lot better and just how much it must have been in Lincoln's head, how important it was to hold on to. But, you know, regarding Braxton Bragg leaving, I wonder if he's got the ghost of Sher- or of um, Shiloh in his head and he saw what happened to to Beauregard, you know, and he's like, shit, is that what's going to happen to me? What happens to happen to Beauregard getting called the principal's office and getting fired? But I think he, you know, didn't want to risk it that what had happened at Shiloh again, because Bragg was at Shiloh as well. And, 
you know, a lot of his subordinates are not happy with this decision that they want it to stay. Um, you know, I mentioned Claiborne's men call, you know, they're going behind Bragg's back and they're saying he's a coward and stuff. Um, but the other thing here too is Buell, you know, and I was just, I don't know why I thought of this, but, you know, say what you will about Joseph Hooker at Chancellorsville, but Joseph Hooker was concussed uh-huh. at Chancellorsville. I think the pinwheel here needs to pass to Buell <laughs> because like he's fully conscious and he's getting reports and he's like, nah, there's not a battle. So I think we need to let Buell hold the pinwheel for a while. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think, I think when you're looking at this battle, I think, you know, um, he clearly, you know, and you know what though, he's, they swear by the acoustic shadows, there's all kinds of hills and undulations yeah. that roll through there. I mean, you can see how, but you have to wonder when he got that messenger, right? Yeah, you why know, he didn't. Why he did, how he reacted to that. So if you're looking at MVPs of this battle, it's, in, I mean, Alexander McCook is probably the guy. Yeah. I mean, I think realistically speaking. I would give it to him. Um, and it's tough to say on the Confederate side. Um, I would give it to Leonidas Polk for just getting out of that situation. Myself. Well, that was amazing. It, between between Polk and, and Claiborne just Kool-Aid manning it. Like, but then because he Kool-Aid mans it, he eventually has his uh, flanks exposed, right? So he's open up to fire from the Union, start firing at him when he does that. And then Bushrod, of course, gets pissed off at him for what he does, right? Yeah, and that, that's, that, that's, you talk about these guys, these, these, these men in battles and these alpha dog types, you can imagine the conversations that went on with this and um, behind the behind the scenes stuff, I think. But I think at the end of the day, when you look at the Battle of Perryville, you have to look at the whole Kentucky campaign. And this is a culmination of all those things we talk about, including yeah. Donaldson and Henry, Columbus, obviously Richmond, all the ones that took place in that that theater, because it all led to this culmination of this bloodletting, this battle, this massacre that was the Battle of Perryville. So yeah. I think it's um I think doing this the way we did it is the, probably the best way to do it because I think it sets mm-hmm. it up basically pretty well, and I think um and I think it's one that I think I think is one that really should be. I don't want to say study more because a lot of people study it. I don't think people appreciate it. No, and I think I think what you see happy or what you see happening here at Perryville is not just, you know, a battle with, you know, military strategy, whatever you see the emotions of the men, right? Because I think in real time, they are going to know how important Kentucky is. They are going to know. Was about this battle that we don't know if it'd be Kentucky fried chicken, Mary. (laughs) Exactly. But you think about what you think about what's happening there, you know, that the union manages to maintain control over Kentucky for the rest of the civil war. Um, And Antietam and Perryville together are two huge turning points in the civil war. I know a lot of people say Antietam, but after studying Perryville, I'm starting to rank it right next to Antietam for, for turning points that both needed to happen. You know, Mm -hmm. if they'd lost Perryville, who knows what would have happened with the emancipation? I mean, I, it probably would have still went through, but you know, what's that going to do for Northern morale if, you know, the Confederates gain control in Kentucky, right? Like, it's just, it's one of those things that when you study it, you realize what an important piece of the puzzle it is when it comes to the Civil War and that, you know, you need to look at it as much as we look at something like Antietam, I think. So what's coming up next, Mary? What's next? Uh, So next we are doing uh, Cedar Creek. Um, we are not having our Facebook live this Saturday because we both have some other stuff going on. So we unfortunately are taking the weekend off from, from doing the Facebook live, but we will be back with you on the 23rd where we will be talking Perryville and Cedar Creek on that Facebook live. Um, and then the next episode we have after that is Jay Price. Our friend Jen is going to be joining us to talk Halloween and just another little housekeeping thing. We will be having our round table on the third Wednesday or sorry, the fourth Wednesday of this month, just because we both have some stuff going on next uh, Wednesday, the 20th. So it will be on the 27th. So if you've never attended before, um, just be via Zoom. We start at six o'clock and we go till, you know, whenever we start wrapping up kind of thing and no mm-hmm. topic, we just get together, nerd out about the civil war. And if you've never attended before, just info at civilwarbreakfastclub.com and we will send you an invite. And that's going to be Wednesday, October 27th at 6 p.m. All right. Well, I think we can jump off here and head off in the, yep. the, the wild blue yonder. So Mary, again, this is a good time. Again, the pleasure again is always all yours. And I think we can look forward to moving on um, to the next exciting thing. So all I have to say to you, Mary, is go Red Sox. We got some exciting stuff going on this weekend. So we'll have a lot of fun yep. with that. So any and final words from you? There? 
From you, Finchero. <laughs> Go Red Sox. Go Pats. Go everybody. Have a safe yeah. weekend. Hopefully you enjoy this. Hopefully um, you guys have a great rest and the end. best. I can't talk today. The best, <laughs> have a great end of the week. You can just edit that out. I'm sure you can. I'll just edit it. No, I will. <laughs> I know. Anyway, <laughs> but people right. see it on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, hell of anyway so hey have a great weekend everybody uh if you guys when you guys do this and we look forward to seeing you as we always say on the other side okay see y'all later go socks bye, Sox. bye.